hear something called Euler's formula or Euler's equations, all you know is that it's something in math. Because frickin' Euler did everything. Um, like, you know, Euler's equation for the summing of 1 and 1. 1 plus 1 equals 2, right? <clears throat> Euler's equation for multiplying by 0. Then there's the famous Euler's equation for adding 0 and then subtracting 0, but that one hasn't been proven. In fact, I'm not sure it even works. However, uh, the Euler equations we are talking about right now are these fancy things, which are um, Euler's equations for rotation of a solid body. Now, it's important to recognize what these things mean because they're nice and they're pretty straightforward. And you think, hey, this is great. I have equations for omega 1 dot, omega 2 dot, omega 3 dot. Those are differential equations. I can solve them at least numerically and all is well in the world. Uh, but here's the thing that's important to keep track and why these equations are actually kind of hard to use. And that is, is that if you have a body and so X, Y, and Z are just global axes. So that's some inertial frame. So we'll call it at rest because we'll work at the inertial frame which at rest. But the body is rotating relative to an inertial frame. And notice the body I've got here is triaxial. All that means is that the three principal moments of inertia are different from each other. So there's three different axes, triaxial. Um, and I've, give, I've shown you the principal axes. Well, E1, E2, E3, are that are the axes of the omega-1, omega-2, omega-3 of the Euler equations, the principal axes of the body. And there's no requirement that they be aligned along the global axis. Now, you could just say, well, so we'll pick the global axis aligned. Well, you can't necessarily do that because if it's a rotating frame, the um, E1, E2, and E3 axes will all rotate with the body, which means the body's frame is an accelerated frame, so it's not an inertial frame. Um, so if you're doing something like, I want to calculate how is this object going to tumble uh, as it goes flying through the air or whatever you want to do, um, you, it's not as simple as just plugging into these equations and, and being done. Oh, I know my omega dot so I can figure things out. It's not that simple because what you have is the omegas in the frame. So it's worth thinking about what these things mean. But before that, I do want to just, if you look at, um, if you look at these three Euler equations here, you might recognize, if you start with this, so L dot, in an inertial frame, so I'm going to use the, remember the very useful relationship that had the Q's in it, equation 9.30, um, S0, see that's in the inertial frame, is just, that's torque is DLDT. That's all that is. Well, we so we also have from the very useful relationship is equal to L dot evaluated in the rotating frame. So that's S plus omega cross L, right? Um, and where I, he used a capital omega, but here I'm using a lowercase omega. So what lowercase omega here is, is the rotation rate of the body. And because the frame is or really it's supposed to be the rotation rate of the frame, but we're going into the frame of the body. Well, in the body's frame, its angular momentum doesn't change, right? Because it's not rotating in its own personal frame. So that's zero. Um, so what this gives us then is L dot S zero uh, minus omega cross L is equal to gamma. And L, remember, you can write that as lambda 1, omega 1, along the E1 vector, plus lambda 2, omega 2, E2 vector, plus lambda, right. Um, that's just saying because E1, E2, E3 are principal axes um, uh, in that, in that, coordinate system, there are no off diagonal elements of the moment of inertia tensor. So, so that's all that L is. So remembering that you can write L like that. If you expand out the coordinates of this thing, you will get Euler's equations, right? That's, that's what they are. But once again, let's think about what this means. First of all, what we are getting, we are getting the E1, E2, and E3 components of L. And you should object saying, wait a minute, but those are the axes of the rotating frame, but this L with this big, even getting more big arrow on it is supposed to be in the inertial frame. 
And yes, that is the L dot in the inertial frame, but along the body axes. And this is what makes Euler's equations not convenient, is that you have the derivative in the inertial frame along a set of axes, and then an instant later, you have the derivative in the inertial frame along a different set of axes. You do not have an expression for the derivative of the omegas or the derivative of the angular momentum um, along a constant set of axes. You have, it's this, the axes, you're measuring it in the inertial frame, but the components you get are on continuously changing axes. And that's what makes this equation sort of difficult, right? So if you look back at Euler's equation, um, Euler's equations as we call them, again, looking at this, the omega one, omega two, omega three are the um, omegas of the body in the inertial frame, but along the body's instantaneous body's pr principal axes. And that's the same with the omega one, omega two, omega three dots. Um, and the same, you have to, the, the torques along the body's principal axes. So at one instant in time, hey, that's fine. But then later, now the thing is rotated and the axes are all off in different directions. And now you can evaluate it again, but they're along different directions. So how do you work with this? Well, Let's start. We'll do the stability analysis of a free rotator. Um, and um, this is where you watch me toss my cell phone in the air and regret it. Uh, let's start by looking at a triaxial object, right? So it's got three different principal moments of inertia. I'm very sure about this. In fact, let me draw some pictures here. So I want to have a rectangular solid like my cell phone. So we will draw it so it has clearly three different lengths of axis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and label the longest side. I'm going to call it 2A, not just A, because you'll see why. I'll call the intermediate side 2B, and I'll call the shortest side 2C, right? Um, so it's, it's triaxial. And then the principal axes, right, if you really feel the need, go ahead and diagonalize a matrix somewhere, but it will work out that the principal axes are, there's one that way, we'll call that E1. There's another one that way, we'll call that E2. And then the last one's going to be that way, perpendicular to the first two, and we'll call that E3. Right, so now what we want to do is we want to think about what are the moments of inertia around each of these principal axes. And uh, so what do you do? What you do is you add up the MR squared, where R is the distance from the axis of all the little bits of the object. So let's start with um, things rotating around E1 here. Um, which bits are the furthest? That's going to be the bit down here in the corner. And the distance to the furthest bit on E1 is just going to be A squared plus B squared, right? That's the distance from here down to here. Uh, that's that greatest distance. Well, okay. What about E on about E2? If you're rotating about E2, here's the greatest distance. Uh, what distance is that? That's going to be a squared plus c squared, right? And then finally about E3, the greatest distance to that corner is going to be b squared plus c squared. Now, the moment of inertia is not just m times a squared plus b squared, right? You have to do the integral. But if you think about it, what are these most distant points, um, it's, it's also representative, at least um, in terms of the ordering of the three of which has more mass further from the axis and more mass further from the axis is what, is what gives you a higher moment of inertia. So just looking at this, notice um, uh, lambda one, well, that greatest distance, we are summing the two biggest sides, A and B squared. So that's gonna be the biggest. And the number three is the smallest because B and C are the two smallest sides and two is somewhere in between. So this is a case where lambda one is greater than lambda two is greater than lambda three, right? So we've got that ordering of the moments of inertia. And to make sure we know what this means, let's come back E1, lambda one is the moment of inertia about this axis. So the greatest moment of inertia is about the axis perpendicular to the face of the thing. And then the smallest E3, this is the smallest moment of inertia is that's the axis sticking out of the short side of the thing. All right, and if I regret this, I regret it. So here we go, uh, biggest axis, ooh, let's do this so you don't see my phone because privacy laws. Um, the biggest axis is the one that's sticking out like that, right? That's the biggest axis. So watch me toss my phone in the air. Let's do it slower, right? 
Hmm. I don't know if the frame rate's good enough for you to see what's going on, um, but it's going, it's just happy. And now if I do it about this axis that's rotating like that, that's about the smallest axis, right? So brrr, you see the thing going up and coming down and it's basically, right? You can look and you see, can you read the time on this, right? You see the time that this is the top. As I toss it and come down and catch it, the same side as the top. You know, it didn't tumble at all. But then if I do it about the intermediate axis, this is the intermediate axis. Watch what happens when I throw it in the air, right? It tumbles. It doesn't stay. It doesn't just rotate like this, right? Whereas this one did just rotate like this, and that one did just rotate like this. The intermediate axis, well, if you just do half a rotation, it's fine. But you let it rotate. It, it, it's not stable. It, it's, it tumbles, Right, so I don't know if you're actually seeing this. The frame rate may not be good enough on the video for you to see this. Try this with your own cell phone standing on a concrete floor. Nothing will go wrong. So how can we understand this? Well, all right. Let us start with just the lambda one, or not the lambda one, well, whatever, the omega one equation from Euler's equation. So we have lambda one, omega one dot minus lambda two minus lambda three omega 2, omega 3. And you'll notice there's all kinds of patterns here. Remember I pointed out that it was a cross product. And so the one component has a 2 minus 3 in it, right? I mean, it's not, this isn't exactly a cross product, but it, it's like that kind of thing. And in this case, this is going to be equal to 0 because that was a freely falling object. There was no torque on it. Um, ideally, I would have just done this in deep intergalactic space. So that it would have just kind of hovered there. We couldn't do that, but freely falling turns out it's just as good. Take general relativity. We'll talk about how freely falling is just as good. I think we even do a little bit in special relativity in modern. Take a time derivative of this, right? Well, the principal axes, uh, the object is rigid, so the principal axes are constants. So that first term is easy. Minus constants, but now we have to product rule uh, to get this thing to work. So we're going to have a W2 dot Oh my goodness, I just called it W. It's omega. I'm killing my own soul. Sorry, omega 2 dot omega 3 plus omega 2 omega 3 dot, right? I'm just producting rule. That term there is still equal to zero. And that's all well and good. Um, but now what I want to do is substitute in. Like, for example, we know that omega 2 dot is equal to lambda 3 minus lambda 1 omega 3, omega 1, divided by lambda 2. All I did is I took the lambda 2, or the omega 2 Euler equation, and did the two steps of algebra to solve for omega 2 dot, right? We can do that. We can also substitute in the equivalent thing for omega 3 dot, and we will get this much longer expression, lambda 1, omega 1 double dot, um, equals lambda 2, minus lambda 3. I've added it to both sides. That's what, So the negative side went away because it just made it equals times big thing lambda 3 minus lambda 1 times omega 3 squared omega 1. Right. So where the hell did that come from? This was the omega 2 term. So there was an omega 3 there and another omega 3. That's why it was omega 3 squared. But then we have to have a lambda 2. Plus, and then from the omega-3 dot term, if you had done it right, well, all right, if you had done it the way I did it, and I hope I did it right, you would end up with that, omega-1, omega-2 squared over lambda-1. And this is long. Sorry, not over lambda-1, over lambda-3. All right, and that is long. Um, and so what can we do with this? Uh, well, first, I'm going to make some space on the screen. Well, let's work in the specific case where... Omega 1 is a lot less than omega 3, and omega 2 is a lot less than omega 3. What are we talking about? We're talking about an object that is rotating around one of its principal axes almost entirely, but omega 1 and omega 2 don't necessarily have to be zero, so it could have a small perturbation away from rotating around its principal axis, right? So this is like when I tossed my cell phone in the air and it was rotating like that. Um, in this case, I would have to define omega-3 as the one coming out of the board um, so that it's the thing where most of the rotation is. But there might have been and almost certainly was a small component of omega um, perpendicular to that just because it, I'm not so 
amazingly agile that I can throw it perfectly perpendicularly like that, right? But from from what you saw, hopefully you can accept these limits. Well, okay, what that means is effectively compared to omega-3, omega-1 is dinky and omega-2 is dinky. And what that means is omega-1, omega-2 is double dinky. Right, what do, what do I mean by that? Let's suppose if we take omega-1 over omega-3, so it's unitless, and if it was a tenth, it's only 0.1, right? 0.1 is small, whatever, small enough. Um, if you only have one sig fig, it's small. Whereas, and then if omega-2 is also 0.1, omega-1, omega-2 is 0.01. So if you're keeping things to two sig figs, you have to keep your omega-1 and omega-2, but then your omega-1, omega-2, you don't necessarily need that one anymore. So if you look at these terms, well, I have one dinky here, and I've got to keep it because otherwise the whole thing becomes zero, and I want to see what happens above zero. So I can't get rid of that. But here, well, this whole thing, right, this is triple dinky. This is dinky, and this is triple dinky, three dink. Sounds like a wrapper or something. Um, so I'm going to ignore this term. I'm going to say that term is small compared to the other term because of these assumptions up here that I've made, right? And so then having done that... If we solve for omega-1 double dot, we just get this, right? So the triple dinky term has been tossed aside callously. I also rearranged one of these subtractions and pulled a negative out front. Why did I do that? Well, notice everything in parentheses is constants. What we have is omega-1 double dot is equal to some minus some constant times omega-1. Now, this is one of those differential equations I'm saying you should always recognize. Um, one differential equation you should always recognize, I'm going to use x here, x double dot equals minus, oh, I'm going to use capital, omega squared x. That's the simple harmonic oscillator. That's going to have solutions, right, of e to the i omega x, or sine omega x, or stuff like that, right? That's what you get. On the other hand, if you have x double dot is equal to k squared x, with k, where it's a positive number, and so it's squared, you could be very confident, even if k is negative, k squared is positive here, that's going <coughs> to have solutions of e to the kx, right? Really, so the general solution is going to be a e to the kx plus b e to the minus kx. Um, that will solve this differential equation. All right, so, so what's important about all of that stuff I just said is that if you look at the sign of this constant c, Um, if C is greater than zero, omega-1 is a sinusoid. And if it's small, it'll oscillate and stay small. It'll be small, positive, then small, negative, then so on and so forth. On the other hand, if C is less than zero, omega-1 is an exponential. And, okay, so maybe it's an exponential decay and we don't worry about it, but there's also a term that we have no reason to set to zero that's an exponential growth. Omega-1 won't necessarily stay small. It'll grow, right, exponentially grow, and eventually, in fact, pretty quickly, because exponentials tend to be powerful. Now, of course, you could have a very tiny constant on that exponential, but eventually an exponential wins. Eventually, it's going to get big enough that our dinky assumption about omega-1 will break down. So, for stability, we need this. And if you look, what do you need to be positive? You need one of two things. Either these two terms in parentheses both have to be positive or they both have to be negative. So you need omega three, sorry, omega, lambda three. Um, I should call it upside down y, right? Because I called omega w and I hate myself. You need lambda three greater than lambda two and, right? That's the standard logical symbol for and. Lambda 3 greater than lambda 1, or you need lambda 3 less than lambda 2 and lambda 3 less than lambda 1, right? You need one of these two conditions. And if you think about what does that mean, either lambda 3 has to be the biggest or lambda 3 has to be the smallest. If those are not satisfied, then one of these is negative and the other is not that's going to give us a positive C. And so the result of all of this is that rotations, free rotations of an object, of a triaxial object, around its intermediate principal axis, so that's the principal axis whose moment of inertia is intermediate of its three moments of inertia, 
are not stable because oscillations um, in other directions will tend will grow. Whereas about the the largest or smallest um, principal axes, or the principal axes with the largest and smallest um, moments of inertia, um, things that are not along that axis, small perturbations not along that axis, just kind of stay there and wiggle around a bit. Right? And so that explains what we were seeing there with the um, what we were seeing there with the stel cell phone tumbling around. Right? I'm going to do it again because I haven't broken my cell phone yet, so the night is young. Right? When it rotated like this, it was stable. That was around the smallest moment of inertia principal axis. There's junk on the cell phone. What is that? Who even knows? Um, when it rotated like this, it was stable. But when I tossed it like this around the intermediate, that's when it tumbled, right? Right. So you should definitely try this um, and notice that um, you can't get the thing to, to stably rotate like this. And it's kind of interesting that all this crazy math stuff actually works out to something. Ha! Huh. All right. So next, we have these Euler equations. We've used them for a stability analysis, and that's already an interesting result. But what if you really do want to go ahead and figure out an object's tumbling? What is its orientation as a function of time? How the heck do we use these equations, given that it's giving us stuff around axes that are constantly rotating? right? And in particular, the question I want to ask is, how do I figure out where, which way in space are the principal axes of the body pointing as a function of time. So we'll do that next. Let's start again with the symmetric top. Um, right, so I'll, I mean, you can, without loss of generality, we can pretend it's a cylinder because a cylinder is a thing where two of the principal axes are the same, right? So E1 and E2, not the same, but they have the same moment of inertia. We have E3. So we're going to say we've got lambda 3 as the principal axis about uh, E3, and then E2 and E1, we have lambda. I'm just saying lambda is equal to lambda 1 equals lambda 2, right? Those, those two are the same each other. That's what we mean by a symmetric top. Um, and we can be sure that these are the way the principal axes are because you have rotational symmetry. You know, what do I mean when I say I have rotational symmetry? I want to do an aside here briefly. Um, what that means is, let's just imagine that you look down on this thing from above. And if I'm looking down from above, then E1 might be that way, and E2 might be that way. Now let's rotate the whole thing by some arbitrary angle theta. And when I have done that, E2 is now this way, E1 is that way. But notice the mass distribution is exactly the same. The mass distribution has not changed, um, which means that that and that are the principal axes. Well, then if I rotate it back, these are what those principal axes would have been. So any of these has to be a principal axis. Th this is a, a sort of more rigorous way of thinking about symmetries is what transformation can I make to the object that does not change the mass distribution of the object? You probably did all kinds of stuff like this in ENM. Um, I know that when I do, those of you who've had an ENM, and those who haven't, next year we will do this because symmetry is very important for figuring out a lot of simple cases in ENM. Um, great, so that's the, um, this is the symmetric top that we have. So if we start with the lambda 3 equation, or sorry, the omega 3 equation, lambda 3, omega 3 dot minus lambda 1 minus lambda 2, omega 1, omega 2 is equal to gamma 3. And I'm overlapping myself, but it's different colors, so you can think, right? And now here, in this case, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are the same, so lambda 1 minus lambda 2 is 0, which means if we're talking, and we're going to talk in free top, for the most part. So if that is zero, that tells us that lambda three omega three dot equals zero, or omega three is equal to a constant, right? Now, um, in the analysis of the uh, top that we did last time, we sort of assumed this and kind of argued later that it was true. Um, and it turns out actually that time, if you look at it, this was it wasn't actually a free top, but what we had was the force acting at the center of gravity was that way. The lever arm for the force was that way. And then E3 was that way. Well, if you take a cross product, so R and FG and E3 are all coplanar here. So if I take cross product of R and FG, I get something perpendicular to E3. So in this case is also one that had torque three equals zero. So 
omega-3 dot really was zero, and it stayed zero, so the thing kept rotating at a constant rate. Now, the real top didn't. Why? Because there were frictional torques here that, that we're neglecting in this analysis, or that we had neglected in the last analysis. But now, I want to actually think about... Um, I'm going to think about the free top here. Now, another thing I do want to notice is that our stability condition will be satisfied as long as omega-3 is not equal to, sorry, not omega, lambda-3 is not equal to lambda, right? If you have a sphere, I guess that's a symmetric top, um, right? It'll, I mean, it'll work, but um, let's go ahead and just assert for now, for at least so it's easier to think about, lambda-3 is not equal to lambda, which means lambda-3 either has to be the biggest or the smallest, because lambda-1 and lambda-2 are the same as each other. So oscillations about this rotation should be stable, based on all the stuff that we argued before. All right, so we're going to work with lambda-3-0, which tells us that, that omega-3, not lambda-3, gamma-3, I need to learn my Greek letters, which tells us that omega-3 is a constant. And so what about the other two? So scribble all that out. Um, let's do the other two. We have lambda omega one dot, right? So that was lambda one, but I'm making them the same as each other. Minus lambda minus lambda three, omega two omega three is equal to zero. And lambda omega two dot, by the way, I should mention what I'm doing here is very much like one of the homework problems. That's the one with the space station with rockets on it, except their omega-3 dot is not zero. So it's a little more complicated than what I'm doing here. But the same basic idea will, will work. All right. So we have those two differential equations. We already know that omega-3 dot is zero. right? So whatever it starts at, so it's just an initial condition. Whatever it starts at, it stays at. So we want to figure out the uh, differential equations for this. Well, so I look at this, and I don't really know what to do with it. But I do notice that I have a constant, right, that times that is a constant times omega-2, and then I have a constant times omega-1 with the omega-2 dot, and that kind of reminds me, wait a minute, that's like that circular motion thing. Let's try a solution of the form xi is equal to um, omega-1 plus i omega-2, right? Basically, what I'm going to do is... Uh, combine these two together into a single thing, omega-1 plus i omega-2, for xi, and then I will try a solution for xi of the form E to the i capital omega t uh, plus phi naught. Why phi naught? Why not phi naught? All right. I'm going to try that solution and see if it works. Well, xi dot, which is, of course, just omega-1 dot, plus i omega 2 dot is equal to i omega a e to the i omega t plus phi naught, which is equal to i omega xi, right? That's the real benefit of using this form of the solution as you get that. So xi dot is just equal to, and I can just go ahead and plug xi back into it, i omega, capital omega, lowercase omega 1, minus omega omega-2. Where did the minus come from? It's because I multiplied the i by this i, and the squared became a negative 1. Right, so that's what xi dot is. So uh, what can I do with this? Well, given how we wrote xi, we can also write xi dot as lambda times omega-1 dot plus i omega-2 dot, right? That's what xi dot is, um, is equal to and then now what I'm going to do is take these two equations and just multiply the first one by 1 and the second one by i and add them together. And then I'm going to add all the negatives on the left over to the right. So when we're done, we will have a lambda minus lambda 3 times um, a very dead brain, omega 2, omega 3, minus i times lambda minus lambda 3 times omega 3 omega 1. Now, I did a thing here. Notice um, these equations up here, there were negative signs. I added them to the both side. They sh should have both been positive. This one's negative because I also flipped the order of the subtraction. So I didn't actually cheat there. Um, and so I could write omega dot plus i omega 2 dot is equal to um, 
minus lambda minus lambda 3 divided by lambda. I divided the lambda out from both sides times omega 3 times i omega 1 minus omega 2. All right, now what we want to look at, I'm going to get a different color out, is this equation here and this equation here. Right, given our definition of xi, I have on the left, this is just xi dot, right? That's what that's what xi dot is on the left. Xi dot also has to equal this thing here. And look, it does. I have an i omega 1 minus omega 2 if this thing that I'm circling now is equal to capital omega, right? So what we have is, and let me erase a bunch of stuff to make room. I'm going to leave that one down here. I'm going to erase the top. We have the Euler equations. We know them. What we have is, and remember, when I wrote, um, when I wrote xi is equal to omega 1 plus i omega 2, equal to a e to the i capital omega t plus phi zero. What I was saying is that omega one is equal to a cosine omega t and omega two is a, sorry, cosine omega t plus phi naught. And omega two is a sine capital omega t plus phi naught, right? And these work if capital omega is equal to minus lambda minus lambda three over lambda times omega 3. Now this minus is pretty important. When I was, I lost about three hours earlier today when nothing was working and eventually I realized it because I forgot to copy this, uh, I forgot to copy this minus sign down to one line, right? So let's just think about what's going on here. Um, I want to consider two specific cases. Well, first of all, how do you know what A and phi naught are, those are established by your initial conditions. So what, I mean, you need initial conditions. That's always true with differential equations. We had two first order differential equations. We're going to need two initial conditions. So for example, if you have omega one zero um, equal to whatever, omega one zero, that was redundant, but omega two zero is equal to zero. If I have that, those are my initial conditions, then A in this equation has to be omega one zero. And phi naught has to be zero, right? Because that's what will work at t equals zero to make those work. So, you know, and that's actually the specific case I'm going to work with. I'm just going to pick where are these things in their oscillation at the point when it's all in the E1 direction. Uh, okay. And then uh, let's think about a couple of specific cases. One is this long cylinder like this, where you have E3 um, and E1. And in this case, this is where lambda 3 is less than lambda right? Because stuff is further away on the, um, stuff is further away on the, um, you know, further away that way than it is that way. And then the other thing we could have is we could have the disc, right? Where that's E3, that's E1. And this is the case where lambda three is going to be greater than lambda, right? And those are two cases. And why does this matter? Because it changes the sign on omega, right? And that's going to be, all right, so how do you think about this omega? What do we do with this omega? Um, it's tempting, very tempting to say that omega is the rate of precession. And that's wrong, right? Again, remember, omega is the rate of change, capital omega is the rate of change of the angular velocity about the axis which itself is rotating, right? So if the omega around the rotating axis, if capital omega is the same as omega three, sort of, then, um, well, all right, you know what, rather than do this, let me, let me work the math out a little bit further and we'll see what's going on. So for now, we're gonna hold on to this result and I'm gonna set this result aside uh, for a few minutes. Um, remember it, I'm gonna come back to it, um, but I wanna talk about, um, I'm not done yet. I mean, I figured out analytic expressions for omega one, omega two, so, that sounds like progress, but I still haven't answered the question, how do you evolve E3? Let's do that. Um, so how are we going to evolve? How do you go to orientation? All right, here is something you are tempted to do. Tempt, temp, temptation. 
we are tempted to define a theta vector. And what that theta vector would be is if you have some object, right, and it's rotated um, from, right, so let's suppose that its default orientation is along the z axis, right, you've rotated it by angle theta about some axis in that direction, and then theta vector would just be have magnitude theta and uh, and then the direction would be the direction of the axis it's rotated about. And you're tempted to say, well, and that's just going to be omega dt. So all I have to do is get this omega. I have the components on the E1, E2, E3 axis. All like, well, great. I can convert those to x, y, z, use that to update theta, use the updated theta to figure out how the new E1, E2, E3 point relative to theta. But this will not work, right? This is tempting but wrong. And Owen, I may have actually told you that I thought this would work earlier in computational, and I was wrong. This will not work. What, right, the real answer is going to be more complicated than this. So what can we really do? And we want to come back to thinking about what is, and let's talk about E3 in particular to start with, right? So we have, um, I need to not be erasing. We have, um, you know, here's X, Y, and Z, and we have some object that may be rotating and processing and all of that, and that's E3. And I want to get E3 as a function of time. Well, let's think again about transferring into the body's frame. We have this very useful relationship, which I'm now going to do with E3. I did it with momentum earlier. So the partial derivative of E, not partial derivative, the time derivative of E3 in the inertial frame so that's S0, right? That's the thing we want. We want to figure out, if we can figure that out, we now have a differential equation that we can solve numerically or otherwise um, for what is E3 as a function of time. And then we can do the same thing for E2 and E1. Well, that's going to equal using this very useful relationship, partial E3, partial T evaluated in the S frame plus omega cross E3. Now, again, omega means two different things that are the same here. Omega, called capital omega in the very useful relationship, is the rotation of the rotating frame relative to the inertial frame. But then our rotating frame is the frame of the body. So it's also the omega of the body, right? Just because we've chosen that to be the frame. Now, in the body's frame, E3 is constant. In the body's frame, E3 always points along the axis of symmetry. So this is zero. So this gives us an equation, dE3 dt, that we can use is omega cross E3 in order to figure out how does it evolve, right? So how do we, how do we actually use this? Well, let's actually go ahead and, and calculate omega cross E3. Now, you're tempted to draw this, and the way we usually do, I know I'm going to need more space, so I'm going to wipe that out. You're tempted the way you usually do of saying, okay, when I do a cross product, I'll put x hat, y hat, z hat, omega x, omega y, omega z, right? So on and so forth, and work out the cross product. But I'm going to recommend you not do this. And instead, for reasons, instead of doing it in the global frame, let's just do it. And you can do this. I mean, all this matrix thing is, is a shorthand for, for if you distribute out all the cross products, let's do it in the E1. E2, E3 thing, because then this is omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, which is exactly what we have expressions for, right? In fact, in our specific case, omega 3 is a constant. Omega 1, omega 2, we have those analytic expressions um, for the top. And then E3 is just 0, 0, 1. And you can see that this cross product becomes much less painful. And you end up with, multiplying this out, that D E3 by DT is equal to omega 2, E1 minus omega 1 E2. You can even make that intuitive. Um, kind of hard to think about, but let's imagine. Um, wish me luck here trying to do this. So if E1 is out of the page and E2 is that way and E3 is this way, the rotation of the body um, in the omega 1 direction is a rotation like that, right? Which means instantaneously E3, the E3 unit vector has to be moving that way, which is in the E2 direction. And then the rate it's moving is omega 1 E2, um, except negative sign, right? Because actually this would be a uh, negative rotation. Oh, don't do that. 
neg rot. That would be a negative rotation. Use your right-hand rule. Um, rotation would have been the other way around. So hence the negative sign. You can do, so, you know, so this ex expression actually kind of makes sense. And if you do exactly the same exercise, and remember, how did we get this? We started with this just frame transformation equation. Um, and then use that to get down to this. And that's something we can work with because omega-2 and omega-1 are things we have expressions for. Likewise, if you had worked it all the way out, um, just basically follow exactly the same procedure for E1 and E2, you would get DE1 DT is equal to omega-3 E2 minus omega-2 E3 and DE2 by DT is equal to omega-1 E3 minus omega-3 E1, right? Cross products. So now we have something we can work with. At least in the symmetric top case, we have analytic expressions for omega-1, omega-2, and omega-3 all as a function of time, omega-3 being a constant. Um, so you could imagine solving this numerically, and I will shortly, by just starting with some initial E1, E2, and E3. We have expressions. In fact, if you're cleverer than me, you might actually be able to integrate it and come up with an analytic solution for E1, E2, E3 as a function of time. In fact, almost certainly you can. I didn't. So that's an exercise for the alert reader. You guys who've done differential equations re reason recently, go ahead and figure that out for me. Thanks. Um, well, okay. So... And so given those expressions, now we can just integrate it up and solve it, and, and you can have the whole thing going. I'm going to do that shortly. But I want to consider another case, too, where we don't have analytic expressions for these. What can we do? What can we do? Well, I want to think. All right, so then we need to come up with some derivative for omega as well. So remember these. We're going to come back and use these again. I going to need to come up with a derivative for omega. Well, let's just start by remembering that we can write omega vector as omega 1 e1 plus omega 2 e2 these are unit vectors plus omega 3 e3 and so then d omega dt is not omega 1 dot e1 plus omega 2 dot e2 plus omega 3 dot e3 because remember e1 e2 e3 are not constants it's omega 1 e1 oops not dot there goodness So omega 1 e1 plus omega 1 e1 dot plus omega 2 dot e2 plus omega 2 e2 dot plus omega 3 dot e3 plus omega 3 e3 dot. And that looks very long. However, here's a thing. Let me just, I'm going to gather together the terms with the dots on the e's on them. So omega-1 e1 dot plus omega-2 e2 dot plus omega-3 e3 dot. Well, we just had those expressions on the previous screen. Let's go ahead and substitute in for them. That's going to be omega-1. Remember what e1 dot was omega-3 e2 minus omega-2 e3 plus omega-2. And then e2 dot was omega 1 e3 minus omega 3 e1. And then finally omega 3, and we can substitute in the e3 dot expression we had from the previous page, um, is omega 2 e1 minus omega 1 e2. And now if you look at this expression, I want to compare some terms. Notice here I have an omega-1, omega-3, e2. I have a minus omega-1, omega-3, e2. Those two terms subtract each other out. Next, here, I have a ome minus omega-1, omega-2, e3. Here I have omega-1, omega-2, e3. Those two terms subtract each other out. And then finally, the two terms left, I have it a minus omega-2, omega-3, e1, plus omega-2, omega-3, e1. These terms subtract each other. Hey, look, these things that you would have, if you had forgotten that e1, e2, and e3 were not constant and left them out and you would have done it wrong, it turns out you would have done it right by accident anyway, because this particular sum works out to be zero. 
So we are left with this convenient thing, omega dot is equal to uh, omega dot E1 plus omega dot, omega 2 dot E2 plus omega 3 dot E3, and that is, is nicer to work with. So now, what do you do with this? How do you work with this? Uh, all right, so note that we have um, differential equations for a whole bunch of different things at this point. If I can just wipe all that out. Um, we have differential equations for the time derivative of E1, E2, E3, well, and then omega, we don't, I haven't actually given you one, but you could figure out omega dot. Uh, no, we, we don't have expressions for these, right? Because these are the Eulers. Duh, of course, that's where we started, right? The Euler. So you've got expressions for all of these, right? And notice since each of these have three components, you track 12 variables. And you have a time derivative for each one. So you have a whole bunch of first order differential equations. You can solve it numerically if you want, right? Um, and uh, it, that will give you, by integrating up E1, E2, E3, the vectors as a function of time. So you know how to orient the object. Now, here's the thing though, if you think about it though, we have 12 variables, but really there's only six independent ones, right? Because you only need three angles. And when we get to the Euler angles in the next reading, you need, only need three angles to specify the orientation of a body. Here's one way you can think about it. And that is you need the theta and phi, right? The standard theta and phi of spherical coordinates to specify which way it is. And then imagine that this object was painted with a, a stripe on that. So you could tell if it was rotated, you'll need one more orientation to, to describe how it's rotated around its own axis. So that's enough. You only need three things to specify its orientation and then three things for their derivatives, right? So these are, remember, that would be sort of the first order and second order thing. And yet here I am tracking 12. Here are the three derivatives, but I've got um, nine different numbers to keep track of the orientation. So there's redundancy here. Well, and it turns out we can very quickly get rid of some of the redundancy. We want to keep E3 because we like it, but Notice that E2 cross E3, because these are unit vectors, E2 cross E3 is just E1. So throw out E1. Don't solve for E1. Only solve for E2 and E3. Um, and then just calculate E1 like this when you need it. Now we're down to nine variables. And here, what, we're just going to live with that. We're actually solving for three more variables um, than we need to. Uh, there are ways around this to make it smaller. I'll, I'll link you to a paper I found about this. Um, but we have something that we can work with now. Now, we should be a little afraid because when you're solving for more variables than you have, there are constraints that should link those variables to each other. And it's possible the solution will violate the constraints. And if the solution violates the constraints, it's not a valid solution. So you know something's gone wrong. And why would that happen if your equations are right? Well, numerical errors could build up, for example. Anyway, we have a procedure that we can use now. Right? So let's use this procedure. Okay, so I have some code here that's going to solve these equations. So, junk at the top. Um, first of all, I wrote a function here. Um, it takes in, so lambda is lambda 1 and lambda 2, right? Those are the two uh, things. Well, so lambda 3 is the axis of symmetry, then lambda is the other symmetric top. So lambda 1, lambda 2 are the same. Omega 1, 0, that is the initial omega 1. So I'm working specifically on the case where omega 2, 0 equals 0. I've just chosen to do that. T is time. And then omega 3 is the con is a constant. So here's this capital omega that we worked out before, which is not the precession rate of the body. Okay. Uh, and we'll look at that momentarily. And then I can just calculate omega 1 and omega 2 right in here. This is the case where A was omega 1, 0 and phi 0 was 0. So great. So I can get omega 1, omega 2 out of that. Now here is, I'm doing this with a solver similar to your Runga cutter. I'm using psi pi to integrate to ODT, but it's the same thing. It has the derives um, function here, which takes T and the values, and then I've passed the same extra constants we need. Vowels, the uh, variables I'm going to solve for, are E2 and E3, right? So E2x, E2y, E2z, E3x, E3y, E3z. Um, and again, it's twice as many as I need, because I really should, once I have... Um, E3x and E3y, and then say E2x, and why that? Because E3z, you can figure out from E3x and E3y, because it's a unit vector, 
yada, yada, whatever. We're solving for too many variables. We're going to survive. Um, though that's what I'm solving for. And so just for convenience, I pull out E2 and E3 just so I can refer to them. And then remember what I said, just calculate E1 is E2 cross E3, whatever you need it. So there we do that. I get my omegas with that function I showed you earlier. Now I need my devals. And again, this is not a second order equation. Most of the time we've solved second order equations because we were solving F equals MA. These are all just first order equations. So I have six variables, each of which I have a first order differential equation for. Um, and what were they? Well, remember this, so zero to three, that's E2, DE2, DT was just omega one E3 minus omega three E1. And this works because E3 and E1 are vectors here, right? So the arrays will work out. And then here's DE3 DT was omega 2 E1 minus omega 1 E2. I've got them. And now I can return the derivatives of the values. Um, so there, I've that's it. I've solved it. Um, and so now in this get access up, don't worry about that. You can look at it later. I'll post this code online. Um, I'm going to set this whole thing up. I'm going to set up a cylinder of mass M, radius R, and height H. Um, so and I, I'll choose some numbers. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, ignore those. This one half m r squared, that's familiar, right? The cylinder moment of inertia. This is the moment of inertia um, that along one of the other two principal axes. So it's h squared over 12 plus r squared over four. Um, this is a case where because h is a lot bigger than r right here, this moment of inertia is gonna be bigger than this. Um, even with the one over 12, right? Because three squared is nine um, and 9 twelfths is a lot bigger than 0.25 squared, which is uh, like 0.0625 or something like that, right? Whereas 9 twelfths is three quarters, right? So this, so this is the bigger one. Lambda is bigger than lambda 3. I'm going to start it rotating once per second around its symmetry axis, and then with a small additional perturbative wobble. And we're going to run this and see how it goes. Right oh, so here we go. So here's what we've got. Um, X, Y, Z axes. Um, I start with E3 along Z. So E3 is the symmetry axis of the body. Um, one thing you should notice is I actually overlap two cylinders here. I wanted just one cylinder, but because in PhysViz you can only make each object one color, I can't put a texture on it like I do with Blender, you wouldn't be able to see it was rotating. So I put two cylinders almost entirely overlapped, you'll be able to see it's rotating this way. Um, this purple arrow is the angular momentum vector. Now remember, there's no torques on this. So in this inertial frame here, the angular momentum vector should be constant. And I do recalculate it every time step. I haven't started time yet. I have power over time and I haven't started it. I do recalculate it every time step. So watch this, make sure it stays constant. All right. And here's the, here's the case we're doing. So M equals one, one, what? One mass unit. Hey, <laughs> take that. Think of it as a kilogram, if you wish. Um, that's the mass of the cylinder. R, the radius of the cylinder is 0.25 length units. The length H is the length of the height of the cylinder is three length units. Then lambda, so lambda is the moment of inertia along one of these axes, right? The E1 and E2 axes, which initially are the same as X and Y. I just started them that way. And lambda 3 is the moment of inertia about the E3 axis. And sure enough, look, a lambda is a lot bigger than lambda 3. Um, one consequence, let's jump down to the bottom. One consequence of that is that the capital omega we calculate is in fact negative, which you would get. Um, you would get that omega you would get a negative omega when lambda is bigger than lambda three. Just go back and look at the equation for it. Um, omega three is my rotation rate of the body around its axis, 6.28. Why 6.28? Because that's two pi. And that gives you a period of one second. So we should see this red green thing rotating with a period of one second. And then omega one zero, that's the initial omega around X. You'll think, wait a minute, that's a factor of a hundred down. And this looks like an angle that's not a tangent of one one hundredth, and it's not because this moment of inertia is a lot bigger, right? And so that gives it more leverage on rotating your omega around a little bit. Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and roll it and see what happens, right? So sure enough, you see it's rotating around its own long axis at about one rotation every second as expected, but the precession is a whole lot slower. Now, if you had thought that capital omega was going to be the precession rate, you would have predicted that the precession would have been 
approximately as fast, right? Because 6.03, 6.28, opposite direction, but approximately as fast as the main rotation, and yet it's not, right? It's a lot slower. So what's going on with that? And sure enough, angular momentum was conserved, and here's some plots that pop up at the end. So on the right, we've got the three components of angular momentum, and you're like, wait, angular momentum's not conserved. Well, look at the values. Let's start with LZ. So that's the angular momentum about the z-axis, and that really is about the z, the global z-axis. Up here, so these numbers, small, they're add to all of them basically 0.2, right? This is 0.2 angular momentum units. Um, plus these. And so notice since all these numbers are like one, whatever, six digits down from this, five digits down to factors of one part in 10,000 or one part in 100,000, LZ was conserved. So that's good. And here's LY, same units, basically zero. And LX, now LX does have an appreciable component. It's 0.05. Um, so 0.05 divided by 0.2. So that component, it's like a quarter, right? Um, and then again, the variation is five digits down or four digits down or something like that. So to factor of one part in a thousand to one part in a million, somewhere in there, angular momentum was conserved. That's good. This is the most interesting plot because it's a plot of nothing versus nothing from zero to one. Oh, yeah. All right. This plot is mislabeled. I need to fix the label and I will fix it in the code before I post it unless I forget, in which case I won't. This says E2.x really e2.x hat. Really, this is e3.x hat. This is the x component of e3. And then e3, remember, is the symmetry axis of the body. So right now it has a positive x component because it's pointed off that way. It would have a zero x component if it was perfectly aligned with z. And if you look at what it does, um, I actually don't know what this is. I don't know what that plot is. I'll have to look at that later. But this certainly is, I think this is e3.y hat. And I think this is E3.x hat, because this looks right, because it started along the z-axis, x grew, it came back to zero. And the time it took, notice, was I don't know, like 24 seconds, something like that. And if you look at if you look at the numbers again, notice that um, the difference, well, really the sum, omega-3 plus capital omega, that sum is about um, 0.25, and 0.25 is roughly 1 20th of six, approximately, like insofar as 0.25 is 0.3, and insofar as 6.3 is six, 0.3 is 1 20th of six, right? So you ex so that was a period, a factor of 20 longer. It looks like the period of precession is actually the sum of these two things, not the difference. And that's kind of interesting, right? Well, but if you stop and think about it, it kind of makes sense. Remember, what was capital omega? Capital omega was the thing that showed up in the sinusoids for omega-1 and omega-2. But omega-1 and omega-2 are the angular velocities in the body frame. So if omega-1 and omega-2 are changing um, in a circle in exactly opposite direction and exactly opposite rate as the rate at which the body is moving, that means that the body's not processing at all. Right. See, see what see what that means is that the the rate at which the direction of the uh, various axes in the body frame, the, their rate of change evaluated in the instantaneous body frame, instantaneous inertial frame aligned with the body. If that rate in one direction exactly offsets the rate that the body is rotating, that means those axes are not moving. And so that's why it actually would be the sum of these two things. Right? Like the, the capital omega needs to be the negative of the omega-3 to be going in the opposite direction. And that's why it was so slow. So um, capital omega, not the precession rate, not at all the precession rate of the body. Right. So that's what we get. This is just another thing. What I've added here are these three sort of faded out axes. That This is really E1, E2, and E3. And I've tacked them on the end of the cylinder. Really, their origin should be at the center of the cylinder, right? Because as the center of mass is its pivot point, what it's rotating about. Um, but then this E3 would have been buried inside the cylinder and you wouldn't see it. So I've just moved it out here so you can see it. And right, so as you rotate, you'll notice, sure enough, um, these two, E1 and E2, are rotating around at, um, at, at omega-3. Um, and you can see this axis processing around the angular momentum axis. And the angular momentum axis stays constant. Right, so that would be, that's the result of the calculation 
of E1, E2, and E3. So really, these three directions are what I calculated, and then I did some calculations based on those. So that I solved the differential equations for those. I did some calculations based on those to figure out how to orient this object, the big cylinder. Finally, one final thing. Um, I wanted to do the disk. So this is here. If you look over on the left, you'll notice um, lambda is 1 and lambda 3 is 2. So this is the case where the moment of inertia about the symmetry axis is bigger than the transverse moments of inertia. And again, those are in units of mass times length squared. There's the R and the H I did to get these particular things. Um, I made omega 1, 0 a factor of 10 bigger this time. The reason is because of the way the moments of inertia came out. I needed it bigger so that this uh, angular momentum axis wasn't almost in, invisibly different from the z-axis, but now you can see it is tilted a little bit. And now with omega, th sorry, with lambda 3 bigger than lambda 1, omega comes out positive, and just because of the way the calculation works out, <clears throat> in fact, if you think about it, um, 2 minus 1 divided by 1 is exactly 1, and yet here they are different and not exactly. So what that means is these aren't exactly 2 and 1, it's just the number of digits I printed, they were two and one, but they're probably different in the third significant figure, something like that. So um, these two omegas are almost exactly the same as each other. And so the difference is very small. So you might think a very small, slow procession, but watch, right? And this is wobbling fast. And this might remind you of when you've thrown a Frisbee or a dinner plate. Um, uh, go do that. Go get a glass dinner plate and go fling it around and say it's for science. Um, you notice the procession rate is really quite fast. It's wobbling really pretty fast there. Um, and we'll wait till it finishes here after 30 seconds and we'll get the plot up and we'll actually figure out what was that procession rate. I'm guessing it's going to be about half a second will be the period of the procession. All right, and here are the plots uh, once again. Oh, you can see that angular momentum was conserved, although there were numerical errors. Notice that X is starting to be a little alarming because it's changed in the really one. It only was four digits down where the change happened. But okay, so there are some numerical errors. All right, the period is fast, and now these labels are right. This really is the Y component of E3. This is the X component of E3. So let's zoom on one of these guys here so you can see it a little better. Group. And look at that, two oscillations in one second. The period of oscillations was double E3, which was one oscillation per second. Um, not the period, the frequency is double. And remember, that's because omega-3 and capital omega were almost exactly the same. So the sum of those two is what's going to give you the precession rate in the inertial frame. And sure enough, that's what we saw here. All right. So I think that's it for this week. Not this week, today. Well, this week too, because it's Friday. So Butter was sleeping, but because you guys need your kitties, here's the kitty. See Butter? Butter, say hello. Butter says, I was sleeping. Meow. Go all close. Meow. Yes, she says, I'm a kitten. Were you a sleepy kitten? She says, what are you doing? Poor little Butter's a nice kitty. Yes, Butter's a nice kitty. Yes, Butter's a nice little kitten. Meow.